Welcome to Learning with Lisa, Student Success Beyond Expectations podcast with Lisa Navarra, award-winning educator, consultant, behavior specialist, author, and parent. Welcome to today's episode, What It Feels Like to Be Different. Today's guest is Deanna Sass, and Deanna is a licensed associate counselor, certified pastoral counselor, and a national certified counselor. She services through psychotherapy, marriage and family counseling, and children and adolescents. She has been a counselor for over 10 years, and I'm thrilled to have her with us today. Welcome, Deanna. Thanks, Lisa. Great to be here. Deanna, within your practice, I'm sure you've seen many children and many adolescents. And when it comes to whether it be what their experiences are at home, in school, or even at play, what would you say is one of their biggest challenges? Well, what I've noticed is there seems to be a cumulative effect, almost the way erosion takes place on planet Earth. You know, a little trickle from a, from a water source over time can create a, a huge rift and even a crack and, and even a separation of, of the, the plates. Um, and there are things like that that happen in the lives of our children and young adolescents and, and teens. Uh, if they are experiencing themselves, as different in some way. That could have to do with learning disabilities, that could have to do with other types of disabilities or limitations. Um, some of it has to do with just looking different for one reason or another. So uh, the, the child who feels different in any way, in some way, um, over time really experiences this sort of erosion of their, their sense of self-esteem uh, and their sense of peace uh, with who they are and with themselves. Um, and that can create so many different issues down the road, again, with time as, as with erosion. Um, and I've noticed, you know, quite a bit that in the school setting, for example, when it becomes very obvious that there are um, students for whom learning comes so easily, and then the ones that for whom it does not come easily, start to shrink into the background. They stop lifting that hand up because so often the answer might be wrong or, or the other children might raise their hands faster so they never get to jump in there. Uh, and over time, they sort of step back, they disengage a little bit from the, the community of the classroom, um, they lose their confidence and, and that then becomes another sort of mark against them, perhaps in the eyes of the educators, oh, well, this child is not participating and the child is not cooperating. So now it's not only the academic struggle, now they're sort of being cited for some behavioral issues or a lack of motivation or um, not trying, you know, and, and all of that really has come from confidence that was lost because they because for them learning is more difficult so especially the undiagnosed um, differences um, where you know it's not being addressed and the teacher doesn't have an understanding that this is something that is beyond the child's control and that needs special attention um, it can really become problematic and that child you know pretty soon might decide that school is not a friendly place for them, not a place they like to be. And then you start seeing the absenteeism and, um, you know, this plays out down the line with dropouts and, and such. So, you know, if we could like look at that earlier in the game, uh, we can make an amazing difference in the lives of these children. And that's just in the school setting. Um, the same thing can happen at home but under different circumstances. So at home, it's not a question of, uh, you know, you're not learning fa as fast as everybody else or you're not participating. It comes with the, um, sometimes with things like ADHD, you know, that very hyper behavior that's just difficult and grates, grates on the nerves of the people who are around them the most, which would normally be siblings or parents. Um, and so that child finds they're yelled at a lot more <laughs> in the home than others, or they can sense that the people around them are irritated. They can sense that um, there's frustration and, and they get 
uh, reprimanded for doing what for them is really all they know how to do. They are not wishing to be jumping around and jumping off couches and, uh, you know, pushing things over and knocking things over and making noises. It's just what their body chemistry is telling them to do. So, yeah. And I, I Please. think that what you're really highlighting, Deanna, is so much wealth of knowledge that I want to go back a little bit because yeah. what you're really talking about here is something that starts out as a feeling of inadequacy, Absolutely. whether it be academic, whether it be social, behavioral, it's a feeling of inadequacy that becomes, from what I'm hearing from you, is systemic. It becomes something that is yeah. becoming much bigger than them between school and at home. Right. And I think that's a really important distinction for our listeners here today to really understand because it, it starts as something that might seem so small right. and then it grows into what you're talking about where now they're acting out and they're out of control, but you've said it. You said the key of what actually this podcast really is about. And that is they don't have the tools or the skills and knowledge to be able to change their behavior without right. help. Right. And so what I'd like for you to do too is to also share some of um, maybe your knowledge or strategies and how you can help the educators listening and the parents and caregivers listening today. If you see that there's a trend of um, inadequacy that the child may be experiencing or a lack or deficit in some skills, right. do you have advice to them to try and stop this cycle before it gets out of control? Absolutely. So the way it presents itself in my office, in my practice, is it doesn't present itself as you know an, an educator's issue, but a, certainly an educator can make a huge difference here. It presents itself as, as more of um, an identifier. The, this child identifies themselves as not as good as, not as smart as, um, deficient in some way, um, in some way just not measuring up. So that is what presents itself in my office. And it's, you know, you could call it a self-esteem issue, but it's really the way that this person that's developing their self-understanding suddenly identifies as something negative. And that negative can be turned into a positive. In the classroom, it's I'm not as smart as. At home, it might be I'm not as good as. Am I bad? Am I, you know, why does the, atten the negative attention always come to me? Um, and that's where, you know, a, a counseling and therapy comes in is to help with that, that identifier that they have adopted as how they understand themselves to be. And I'll, I'll add the third setting, which you have already mentioned, which is in the, the setting with their peers, with their friends and the social setting at play. At play, you know, impulsivity and not really being good at sharing or maybe taking turns or wanting, wanting things right away or grabbing or um, they can, again, they pick up a sense that the people around them are not enjoying playing with them. And then the identifier becomes nobody likes me. I'm not likable. So we've got, I'm not as smart as, we've got, I'm not as good as, and now we've got, and nobody likes me very much. Those become problems, you know, that will follow a person through their life. So, so you've asked me really the most important question. Great. We know what the problem is now. What do we do about it? What are the, what are the tools? What are the, the ways um, to, to remedy this and to nip it in the bud? And I say, without a doubt, the very first thing is if there's any suspicion that there are learning disabilities, uh, ADHD, any of these things um, that may be on board, get this diagnosed, get this, let's get, bring air to it, bring light to it so that we can then get the right professionals in who can address it, who can work with these children, these beautiful children who then can understand that with a different approach. Why, golly, I'm just as smart as 
the next person. And sometimes it might involve medication. And with that medication, by golly, you know, I'm just as good as the next one. I'm not irritating everybody around me now. And you know, sometimes and not always medication, certainly. But uh, and then, you know, in the social setting, it has to do with, again, consistency, consistent messages, instruction coming from the parents sources or the guardian sources of, you know, this is this is how this is what a good friend does. This is how people play together and then they enjoy it and then they want to come back and play again. Um, you know, so it has to do getting things diagnosed and then getting the right professionals in to address whatever the, the uh, issue is so that the child can experience success. So the child can experience the goodness in them, the, um, the how bright they are and how they can be capable of so much. And when you see that happen, and I know Lisa, and, and you're more from the education point of view, when you see that light bulb go off in a tone, when you see that smile, when you see that hand go up because they've got confidence now that they didn't have before, that's priceless. Priceless, that's absolutely. Absolutely priceless. And it's bringing up their self-awareness during that moment of saying, how do you feel? Look at your body. You have a calm mind and calm body. So that way you're making these skills and strategies tangible. Because really the stu studies show that 50 to 70% of second graders are rejected by a close friend, by wow. second grade. Wow. And now you're talking about treatment and medication. And really there's less than half of children who have ADHD that are getting both services. Wow, that's so unfortunate. That's really getting unfortunate. that diagnosis as you're talking about, right. getting the proper treatment that you're talking about is really priceless. So I have yes. a question for you. And that is when these children come to you and you hear them saying, I'm not as smart as, I'm not as good as, if only all those types of fixed mindset um, thinking, how are they communicating this to you? Are they saying it directly to you or in a roundabout way? And the reason why I ask Deanna is because as educators, what can we be listening for? What, right. can, what can we be hearing? So that way we know how to address their right. concerns. Right, so it's very rarely expressed in words. <laughs> and I, I'm sure you're aware of that. Um, yes. It's usually expressed in behavior. And someone who doesn't feel good about themselves, you know, doesn't put, doesn't behave well, doesn't feel like it's worth the effort because it's not gonna do any good anyway. No one likes me, um, I, you know, why should I try hard in school? I just can't get it, I just don't know how. So it rare, so then that person just becomes disruptive or very disengaged, which is sad. They're both sad, both are sad. Uh, and they will both get negative attention generally uh, from the, the adults in their lives, whether at home, in the classroom. Um, and so, so it's what's interesting is the thing that most people think instinctively works is to just say, you know, oh, but you're so good. Oh, you're so smart. And unfortunately, that doesn't really work because the child has a very strong innate radar of truth and, and non-truth. And they know that, you know, if they're only getting 20% of the questions right, you know, on a test or something, someone saying, but you're really great at this. And you know, you're a scientist, you're going to be a scientist when you grow up. That's not going to fool them. What works? That's what doesn't work. Lying to them doesn't work. Flattery doesn't work. What works is helping them experience success. And when they can experience success, because someone who understands their disability has the key to unlock the way they think, the way they learn, the way they can share information that they know. The person who can do that and then they can experience success, that's when they will soar and their self-esteem will return and they will flourish in all three of these settings. So it's not the flattery and the, oh, yay, yay, you know, for everything they do. It has to do with help them experience genuine success. And that is 
the great work, the miraculous work of, of those who work in special education, of uh, these people I admire and respect tremendously because they have that key that can unlock the way that child will learn. And um, there's nothing, nothing that will help them to heal from those, those wounds of, of life, those erosion places. Nothing will help that to heal more than the experience of success. And, you know, as educators, we really, truly want what, what's best for our kids. And it's funny, I literally just recorded episode two, and I had said it this way too, Deanna, tell me what you think. As educators, we work with so many different types of children, personalities and disabilities, especially, Absolutely. especially special education teachers and service providers. Whenever I say teachers, I mean, you know, speech therapists, occupational therapists, anyone servicing and working with children. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we just don't know all that there is to know. But I think a key, one of those keys are, is when a child, they know that we care, but it's more than that. It's that we care to understand yeah. what's, what it is and how their brain is working and what they're doing. Yes. You find that it's a differentiation between I care about you to I care to understand what it is that you're feeling and how you're thinking. So that way, together, we can build a security and trust relationship. Yeah, yeah. I think in more common terms, it's I get you. I get you. Yeah. I understand this. This doesn't scare me. You don't scare me. I under, I know how we can do this. Yes. We can do this. I've seen this before and we've got this, you know, that kind of confidence building um, while giving them the tools to be successful uh, are what, you know, can really make the difference. Um, and, you know, see those light bulbs go off and it's uh, tremendous feeling for a professional to experience that. And I love what you said. I get you and we got this because not only does it convey that message of team player to the to the yeah. child, but as educators, we need that too with mm -hmm. those children who display those challenging behaviors. Oh, yeah. We yeah. need to know that what we're doing and our efforts are making a difference. And I think that could build up educators mm. as well. Yeah. And you know what? You said something else just a moment ago that we understand how you feel. And that's a little bit into the, the counseling realm. But if we can convey to them that we we get that um, how you're feeling right now in this classroom, how how it feels to not uh, be the one whose hand shoots up first, who, who gets some wrong answers sometimes and the other kids might laugh, you know, to have someone actually name that, talk about that, help the child talk about it and say, we understand that that doesn't feel good. And we're going to help you move away from that to something that does feel good. And we are going to do it together. And we know you can do it. And I know I can help you do it. And as you said, the teamwork is beautiful. And you said that word help, I can help you do it, which puts some accountability on them. Uh -huh. And it also puts that kind of that boundary on ourself that I'm there to help and I am going to help, but there's two active parts to make it work. Yeah. Oh yeah. They have to, they have to do their part and they need to know that right from the beginning. Um, but if they have the right tools, they're happy to do their part. It's just when they're frustrated and they're hitting roadblocks that they don't understand why they're hitting. So if we can help them get, get around those roadblocks with the right kind of treatment and the right kind of techniques, um, you know, it's a wonderful thing. <laughs> is there a child that has stayed with you or do you think that you're working with somebody now even that you think you will remember forever? And if so, why? I think I'll remember them all forever. <laughs> uh, cool. And yeah, there are, there are some uh, success stories that are very moving and really touch your heart. Um, and I'm thinking of one and without and using any identifiers, um, you know, someone who really struggled and was undiagnosed for too long. Um, part of that was the hesitation on the part of the parents to even consider that possibility that that there was something wrong. Um, and there was and it wasn't um, really 
encouraged strongly at, in the school as well. But this child, um, once, once it was known what was going on uh, with her um, and the right professionals were brought in and the right plan was developed and the, the right skills and the right way into her mind, uh, her, her whole life really changed. Um, the grades went like, you know, like an arrow straight up. Um, her, her confidence grew, her behavior improved, her friendship circle grew, and, and she's a good, a really good student and, a, and is learning so much more than she ever had before. And that, that experience of success has changed you know, her from, from being really depressed and sullen to being vibrant and happy and a great participator in the classroom and in home life and in friends circles. So, you know, you just see one, one like that and you say, it's all been worthwhile. That's beautiful. Thank you yeah. for sharing that with us. I think we're definitely going to have you on again to talk to parents specifically about the topic of diagnosing and the importance of it and how it could help them. Would you Absolutely. be willing to do that with us? I would love to. Thank you. I'd be honored. That would be wonderful. I had something else for you to uh, consider. If you had the platform of speaking with children right now where um, they struggle, how can you help to turn their I can't into I can way of thinking? Hmm. Just to let them know that you believe in them. Let them know that there are people who have worked with people just like them and had great successes and that those same kind of professionals are going to work with them and just unlock, unlock those doors, unlock, get the key to unlock those doors and open them up and uh, help them to act, act, actualize their full potential. Um, but I would, you know, from the therapy point of view, let this child know that they are capable, that it's just going to be a different way, a different way in and that they are good and that they are bright and they are um, capable, you know, just that they're, they're, and they're lovable and likable and all of that. And that together we're gonna help them um, experience these, these changes and these wonderful, wonderful successes in their lives. So just the positive talk is so important. Deanna, thank you so much for joining us today. I really think that the information and experiences that you shared with us today are really going to have an impact on the way that educators think and really under helping them to understand where children go from that one little seed of a child feeling inadequate and how it can just grow into something systemic but it does not need to stay it, no. in that cycle. It could stop and they could grow right. and flourish right. and reach their potentials. It, it doesn't have to have a sad ending, that story. That story can have a happy ending. And we need to believe in that. And we need to believe in these kids. And we know well, that we do. No one does that more than you, Lisa. I really <laughs> admire the work you do. Thank you so much, Deanna. That means thank the you. world to me. So thank you, everybody, for listening to us today. And remember to help turn your students, I can't, into I can. Join us for the next episode of Student Success Beyond Expectations. Thank you for listening to the Student Success Beyond Expectations podcast, where school leaders, educators, and parents meet on behalf of children who struggle with learning.